Well, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about um, some of our best practices at the ASPCA Adoption Center related to our volunteer program. Um, it's funny to use the term best practices because really they're only the best practices to us. It's a very subjective term, um, but hopefully they'll be like, they're shared practices for you and maybe they'll become some of your best practices too. Um, given the absence of time today, I mean we have an hour but you know it can go really fast, um, I've highlighted in each slide some things in red that I think are sort of our best practices that I want to share with you. So if we don't get to all of them today, you'll be able to sort of refer to them yourselves in the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, I hope to, have a, to leave a few minutes so that we can have some Q&A and also for you to share some of your best practices, maybe um, that would benefit not just me but everybody here today. Um, because after all, we're all here to help animals, right? And the best way to do that is to put our heads together, to be innovative, and one idea can engender another, right? So just because these are our best practices, you may think they're terrible, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they're based on years of our program and what works for us. Good. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, an overview of our program, some of our results in the past year, um, why we need volunteers. Uh, maybe it sounds obvious, I don't know. And then get into different areas of best practices, including opportunities, orientation, safety is our number one priority. We focus a lot on that how we onboard volunteers and communicating with volunteers. That's really important as well. Um, and then I'll talk to you about some of the resources that are available, other resources that are available to you. So as you can see in this slide, um, our adoption center might be a little bit different from some of yours. We actually work in a vertical space. We're in a very highly dense neighborhood in Manhattan's Upper East Side. Um, just to give you some context, and I'm all about context, especially when communicating with volunteers, um, last year we did um, oh, well, the neighborhood. So we are flank we're in the middle of a block on Manhattan's Upper East Side between First and York Avenue. And on one side we're flanked by two garages. Um, it's the last stop on a, on a bus line, so it's like a bus depot. On the other side we have a special needs school, an adopt a human adoption center, a hotel, and an apartment building. Across the street is low income housing as well as luxury housing. There's a lot going on on this block. <laughs> so we have a vertical shelter, and that, and that poses its very own challenges for staff and volunteers alike and the public. In the building, not only is the adoption center, but also the ASPCA Animal Hospital, our spay and neuter clinic, where we did about 60,000 spay and neuters last year, um, and our um, forensics unit, and there's, um, they're here presenting today as well, um, and other programs that are going on in the building. And around the corner, we have our kitten nursery uh, and our canine annex for um, rehabilitation and enrichment. So there's a lot going on <laughs> in a very tight space. Um, we are very fortunate to, um, ha I have a team of four staff, which I know is a lot. <laughs> Some of you may not even have staff dedicated to volunteers. Um, we have a, I have a Julie, who's a senior, a senior manager of um, administra our administrative manager. Barbara, who's our volunteer coordinator for feline enrichment and adoptions. Abby, who's our volunteer engagement, uh, manager of volunteer engagement and programs. That's a new position. We really want to work on volunteer engagement to help us with retention. Um, and Eileen, who's our senior manager for offsite adoptions and foster programs. Our goals for the program are to enhance the quality of life of animals in the shelter, right? Anything that we can do to make them, uh, their, their stay there better and prepare them for adoption at the same time and to provide volunteers with a, an enriching and rewarding meaningful experience and also to, to support staff as they help the animals as well. So I'm going to go over as quickly as possible some of our results. In 2016, um, our volunteers contributed almost 55,000 hours of their time. Of that, um, 46,500 hours directly impacted the animals. That's canine um, enrichment, that's dog walking, uh, in kennel socialization, even reading to dogs. Um, and 13,000 um, 13, hours uh, with cats, that's uh, in kennel socialization. We even have some who do a little bit of agility training with, with cats, anything that we can to do to improve their quality of life. And 12,000 hours of matchmaking. These are our adoption counselors. These are volunteers who meet the adopters when they come in and give them tours and hopefully find um, homes for the animals. Um, and then to prepare them for all these activities, Volunteers gave 8,300 hours of their time to training. So we do a lot of training before anybody can actually participate in an activity, and that's one of our best practices. 
safety is our number one priority. And um, so I manage expectations at orientation, which is you can't just come in and walk a dog at the ASPCA. There's some shelters out there where you can do that. We're not one of them. Uh, so we have a lot of best practices around that. Um, so they have to go through training. We'll talk a little bit more about that. We ask for eight hours a month, a commitment of eight hours a month for at least six months. Um, and last year, our average, uh, the average volunteer gave 51 hours of their time. So we're really not meeting that commitment. You know, some people start in January, some people, you know, came later in the year, but overall we're not quite meeting that engagement. So that's something that we're looking at, constantly evaluating what can we do to increase that number. Because it's much easier to get uh, time out of existing volunteers than to keep onboarding new people. Um, so last year we had about 1,200 volunteers who participate, and that's where the onboarding comes on. We, trained, we brought in about 600 volunteers through orientation last year, but we always have a steady our active volunteer number is about 800 volunteers at any given time. And we, ide we identify vol active volunteers as anybody who has attended orienta completed orientation. Now, some of them never attend another training. They drop off. Or they attend training and they never actually continue to participate. So there's drop off all along the way. But we have about 800 active volunteers at any one time. Um, on an average week, we have 260 unique volunteers who, came, who come to the shelter and clock in. They clocked in, they clock in about 480 times during the year, uh, during the week. I was blown away by that number. It certainly doesn't feel like four, um, 260 volunteers. That's really amazing. 15% uh, of our volunteers have been with us over five years. I think that could be better, but it's not a bad number. Um, and 40% over one year of service. So our retention rate's not quite 50%, and that's something that we, our, our retention rate, and that's something we definitely want to work on. So we have scheduled and unscheduled activities. Our scheduled activities include adoption counseling. Those are the matchmakers. Uh, helping hands, we have to call it helping hands legally. We cannot call it vet assisting. Um, but I'm sure some of you call it vet assisting in your shelters. And kitten syringe feeding. We have, they can actually, volunteers can actually sign up to the database and schedule, say that they're gonna come from two to four o'clock or whatever. We have shifts uh, set up for them. And we have unscheduled activities. All the cat and dog socialization, Volunteers can come at their, t at their own leisure. So if they live around the corner, they can come for 20 minutes at a, on a Saturday. If they live really far away, they can come for five hours. It's on the, at their leisure when they want to come, as long as it's during regular operating hours. Um, and they also provide lots of ad administra administrative support for us. Um, what's really interesting is we thought that the unscheduled activities would be a really great benefit for volunteers. So you're not really stuck to a schedule or anything like that. But for some people, they I think they feel a little bit lost with it. They want scheduled activities so they know I've committed to coming to Saturday at 12 o'clock. It's really kind of interesting. I never would have thought about it that way because for me it's sort of the opposite. But hey, you know what, we have to, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, as you can see our ages, we're, we have a really broad spectrum from we accept students as young as 16 uh, who want to socialize with cats. You have to be 18 to socialize with dogs and 21 to participate in adoptions. Um, so we have everybody from young people to retirees and everybody in between. It's a very nice general distribution. And I'm sure this is probably common in a lot of shelters. 88% of our volunteers are, are female. <laughs> so um, it's really, I mean, I've had orientations where I've had like one man in the, in the, in the group. It's really crazy. Um, so good, mate, good dating thing for them, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so come to think of it. So not only are volunteers a win-win, it's really it's a win-win-win having volunteers on board. It's a win for the animals, it's a win for the volunteers, and it's a win for the ASPCA as well. So why is it a win for the animals? Well, of course they receive plenty of socialization, um, and this improves their quality of life at the shelter. And in fact, we know that the more socialization they can get, the better they show to adopters. They're more relaxed, they're less stressed out, they get used to being, um, uh, touched by different people, so they're not as shy when, when adopters come to meet them. Um, uh, not only do we have, we have different kinds of enrichment, we have a dog reading program. These are for our NYPD rescue dogs, and this is a program that we want to actually bring to the adoption center and to the cats as well, right? Um, it's a very non-threatening sort of enrichment that the animals can get, especially for our NYPD dogs. They're not in the adoption center, they're in a different part of the building. But some of them have, are completely under-socialized or 
and they're afraid of strangers. So we can have volunteers sitting outside their kennel just reading to them. And the staff tell us constantly how impactful this is. Initially, a dog may be cowering in the back of his kennel, and then after two or three people read to him, they start to come forward, and they tilt their head, and they're relaxed, and sometimes they even doze off. It's really cute. We have one volunteer who reads the back, Black Stallion all the time and makes all the sounds <coughs> and everything, you know, for the volunteer, you know, for the dog. And the, they love it. They love it. She makes all the sounds and everything. It's really cute. Um, and of course, um, the animals eventually get adopted, and that's the best outcome for them. And it's a win for the volunteers as well. They can make a difference in the animals' lives. And this is really, they're all passionate about animals. That's why they're there. Um, and they can also learn things about their own animals. They learn a lot about, depending on which, you know, they can do only cats, only dogs, they can do both, they can do whatever they want to do. Um, and they can learn proper, you know, how to care for their own animals, how to read their body language a little bit, how to care for them even better. Um, they gain valuable experiences. We have especially students who want to become LVTs or vets. Having the ASPCA on their resume is a really big deal. And they feel part of a community. Now, I don't know if you ever have this experience where you talk to your friends about your animal and they're rolling their eyes, right? Or they're making audible sighs because she's talking about her dog again, right? They can't stand it. Well, that doesn't happen with us, right? They can come and talk to us about their animals all they want. We love it. They show us their pictures. And also, maybe something not so great is going on with their animal, right? Maybe the animal's just died. We understand. We've had volunteers say, you know, my animal died, and my sister said, oh, get over it, it's just a dog. Well, we would never say something. We understand, right? You're still grieving a long time afterwards. So they really feel part of a community with like-minded people. And of course, hopefully, they feel appreciated and valued. And that's a best practice, right? That's on us to make them feel that they're really part of something and how impactful they're being on, to the animals. And of course, it's great for the organization. They feel priority needs. We're taking in more transports of puppies from the south. Well, it's a lot of work taking care of these puppies. And some of them, they haven't been vaccinated yet, but they need to go outside. So we're having volunteers actually carry them outside. It's a huge time saver for staff, and it's really great for the animals. They're getting used to being touched and carried and getting outside and feeling comfortable. In the city. It's an intense, like I mentioned, it's an intense street. So they're getting used to the sights and sounds of the, of the big city. Um, they adopt animals. We have volunteers who adopt some of these really hard to adopt animals. They're like, this animal's been here too long, I'm taking him home. And they get a 50% discount off the adoption fee. Although all our cats over three are free all the time. So it's sort of a, dis it's a discount of nothing. But, um, you know, uh, but they can, you know, if they want to adopt a kitten, they get a 50% discount or a dog, whatever. Um, they're a resource for all departments. Uh, we can tap all our volunteers for our field investigations and response team to deploy. When we um, take in a dog fighting case or uh, go rescue animals from a natural disaster, we recruit volunteers and say, we need your help. Can you give a week of your time? Uh, they bring all different skills and perspectives. You know, we've been doing things the same way maybe for a really long time. They have really great ideas on how to improve things. A great example of that is how do we know which cats have been socialized, for example. So there's always one cat that's everyone's favorite because he hugs you and he's a lap cat. Well, what about all the other ones, right? So we just have, we use laundry clips, plastic laundry clips that we attach to the kennel card to denote that that cat's been socialized with. So they can see which ones have and which ones haven't. And then they can go through and make sure that all of them are socialized. And then of course you can repeat and go socialize with the other ones again. But the goal is to make sure that every animal gets socialized. And we recently just instituted that for our kittens as well. Um, uh, they're passionate about our mission, and they're great ambassadors for us, right? They can, they can educate the public about what we do, about animal care, the importance of spay and neuter, all these sorts of things. And they have big, some of these people have really big social networks, right? So they can share everything. It's really great. We really encourage them to be advocates, to go to our, to, um, to go to our advocacy center on our website and sign petitions and call, call their representatives. It's a whole army of people out there who can do this. And of course, they're potential donors. We don't know who everybody is, right? And, and every donor is important. If someone gives $5 a year, that could be a really meaningful gift for them. Just like, you know, $100,000 could be less meaningful for someone else, right? So every gift is meaningful. And also, we ask them to talk to their corporations where they work. 
because some companies will donate, will contribute for volunteer time. Bloomberg, if you have the advantage of having someone who works for Bloomberg, they donate $100 per hour, up to 50 hours a year of volunteer time. That's huge. Microsoft, I think, gives $17. Even if it's $1, it's doubling the impact of what volunteers can do. So how do we do all this? Um, well, we start by um, uh, de developing a needs assessment. Well, we're lucky. Most of our core programs, they're well-defined. They've been around for a long time. We're always tweaking, trying to improve things, but sometimes we have a need. So for example, I mentioned bringing the dog reading program to the adoptions area. So how do we do that? So we had to meet with different, op you know, it affects operations and it affects the behavior staff and it affects volunteers and, and all that. So first of all, does it fulfill our mission? Is it impactful for volunteers and is it fulfilling for them to do this? Does it comply with labor laws? I, this is a very important issue for us as a big organization. The Department of Labor is looking at us. We're also a union shop in some areas. So this is a very important issue for us. Does, it, does, the, uh, does the, the opportunity help and not hinder staff? We don't want volunteers getting in the way of staff. It's really important. Is there certain experience required in training? Um, and are there any age requirements for that? So we look at all that and decide yay or nay whether to proceed with the activity. And we've actually decided to go ahead, we're doing a, a beta test of this a reading program where we're gonna ask a select, few, a select group of volunteers to come and read to dogs in the adoption center and the cats off hours. So we're actually gonna be able to extend the hours when volunteers can come. So especially for people who work far away, they can actually get to the adoption center and stay till about nine o'clock. That's gonna be a really big advantage for them. But because it's not hands-on, it's a safe activity for them. And then we create the job, the job description, of course. And then we have to recruit volunteers. Now, um, we're very lucky that recruitment is really not an issue. We have a quarterly application period, and we get about 500 applications every quarter. So, but that's a dual-edged sword, right? That sounds fantastic. Oh my God. You know, we have every volunteer we could possibly want. But we can't train that many people. We can only accept under 200. We can only really accept about 180 volunteers, may maybe 200 if we push it. So that means you're rejecting 300 people. That's not a great thing to have to do. So one of our best practices is to always get back to everybody. And it takes us a while. We have to screen 500 people. And we check them against pet point, make sure they don't have any bad record with us or anything like that. But we have to send rejection notices out. Um, but we always include a link to Pet Finder and to um, Animal Care Centers of New York so they can find another place to volunteer. And we tell them, you're always welcome to reapply. We don't have waiting lists and all this kind of stuff. But we have kind of a reputation as the program you can never get into. So it's, a, it's really a dual-edged sword. So we now have this new core of volunteers who are going to come in over a course of three months. We have four orientations every quarter, so first in the two in the first month of the quarter and then one each month thereafter. And then all the other trainings are tied to that. So within a few days, there's the cat training and the dog training and the adoptions training and so forth and a foster training. Um, so we start every orientation with show and tell. And I think that's the best practice because our, we're a vertical shelter and these group, we'll have um, like 40 to 50 people in orientation. We can't give a tour to everybody. It would be impossible. So, but how can they come to the ASPC and not see an animal, right? So we do show and tell, and we bring an animal up to the, to the orientation where they get to meet the animal, we tell them about it. Typically, we try to bring a pit bull type dog because some people are, you know, they have all their preconceived notions about pit bulls, and they just see how cute they are and loving and everybody, and we go around the room with them, and they get to, to pet this dog. Um, and that's, and I think, a really great, because it really sets the tone. Everybody's happy and engaged at the start of orientation. And then I let them know that they're part of something really big. The ASPCA is, you know, everybody knows the commercials, you know, with Sarah McLaughlin, and it makes everybody cry, and everybody's like, I have to turn it off, I can't watch it. Um, but they're, they're tough, right? But I let them know that, um, especially the younger people who maybe don't know um, the ASPCA, they're really part of something bigger. You know, they're helping animals get adopted, but they're part of a nationwide organization doing really fantastic things. They're part of a really great movement. Um, and then we talk, we talk about the shelter because some of them, it's really funny, sometimes you know, 12 people in the room will have adopted from us and sometimes one person's been there. So I have to go over where the adoptable animals are and they're usually blown away. 
about how fantastic the shelter is. And then we talk a lot about safety, which is our number one priority. And keeping them safe, um, keeping the animals safe and all that. Including bringing home diseases to their own pets. They don't want to do that. So training, you know, they have to understand that they have to go through the training to avoid all these kinds of things. And we manage their expectations. Like I said, that they can't come in tomorrow and walk a dog. So there's a little bit of a delay. But once they've trained, they're good to go. Um, we talk about the uniform requirement. We have orange t-shirts. You'll see that in all the different images. But that's really important. It sounds like a trip. And they have to wear long pants, and they have to wear closed shoes, and their photo ID. Why? Well, and, I, and context is really important. If you explain why to people, they get it. If you just say you have to wear your orange t-shirt, eh, they don't get it. So I say that because if we all decided today in our, dre in our regular clothes to go into a cat room, take a cat out and play with on the floor, hmm, who is that? Is that a member of the public? Is that a staff person? Who is that? We don't know. So by having volunteers in their orange shirts, they're easily identifiable. Staff know that they're authorized to be there. Um, we talk about our euthanasia policy, that these are animals that um, sometimes, have to, sometimes animals have to be euthanized, um, either due to, due to severe um, medical issues or beha aggressive behavior that um, compromise their quality of life and their chances for adoption. Fortunately, it's, it's a, not that frequent an occurrence, but it does happen. Chances are they're not going to really know those animals, but it can happen. And volunteers, sometimes we post the memo for them. They're able to see who's going to be euthanized. Um, some people read it. Some people refuse to read it. And confidentiality, confidentiality is a really big thing. They cannot share that information. But they come into my office, and they ask me about it. What, and there's details in it. But sometimes they're not quite satisfied. And they ask, well, why can't we do this? And why can't we do that? And we talk about it. And I explain to them that, you know, what the process is, that they go through a lot of evaluation, and, but it's a very, you know, calm process, and the animals are surrounded by people who love them, um, and that the staff cry just as much as volunteers do. Um, then termination. They have to understand that if they violate some of these rules, some of them are very serious, that they can be terminated any time um, at, our, at our discretion, um, with or without cause. But we wouldn't do that without cause, but um, it does happen. Um, and then we hand out um, different materials, and I have some copies here if anyone's interested, including our comprehensive volunteer handbook that has all the rules and protocols in it. We ha like I said, we have 800 volunteers, so we have a lot of rules and protocols. And it's not to bust their chops <laughs> with everything, but if we didn't have them, it'd be chaos, because everybody would be doing just what they want to do. So safety is everyone's responsibility. And as the director of the volunteer program, I see myself as being at the intersection of the volunteers, the animals, the public, um, the staff, and the organization itself. And by the organization, I mean keeping us safe from liability. We don't want money going to, to lawsuits and settling suits. We want the money to go to the animals and caring for them. So really, it's our job to uh, keep everybody safe. Um, to do that, we talk. Um, we, we require all this training. It's a two-part training, which we'll talk about. Because um, another big thing, it's not even just against bites and scratches, but it's also avoiding the spread of the contagions around the shelter. Right? We all know these things can spread like wildfire. So by having these best practices, we've really been able to contain it. I don't want the, a volunteer being the one who's responsible for an outbreak, because it's just going to mean fewer, less freedom to do the things that they love to do, which will also impact the animals. If they get hurt or scratched or injured, um, they have to fill out incident reports. And I explain to them, again, context, that not only do we want to know if they're OK and if they get bitten by a cat or something, that they need to wash it out and everything, but if they go to urgent care later, urgent care can call me and say, you know, I've got Lisa here. She has a cat bite. We need to see her, her incident report. I have to be able to produce it by law, or the Department of Health could ask for it. Um, and also, it highlights things. It asks, it asks what was going on when this incident occurred. So we want to know. Maybe there's a behavioral concern that's developing with the animal, right? We want to catch it in its infancy before it develops into a full-blown learned behavior. And finally, um, again, if we can't produce something, we could lose our license to operate, and we don't want that. We're a 151-year-old organization. I don't want the one who's going to bring it down. So. Um, <clears throat> So our training, there's a lot of signage at the ASPCA that the volunteers have to read. And I always talk, you know, just pause, take the time to read the organization. 
but uh, to read the signage. But it's really incredible how, just like you have a monitor with all these post-its on it that you don't even know why they're there anymore, right? It's the same thing with signage. And signage can change at any moment. So we're really, we always try to instill, you have to read the signage. For example, shelter staff only. They can't go in those areas unless they're authorized, but most of them aren't. So I kind of make a joke of it in orientation, like, can you go in there? No, I didn't hear you. Can you go in there? No, you know, and I get them to participate to really drum it in. Um, so we have a two-part training. It's a lecture and then a hands-on training. And the hands-on trainings are provided by volunteers. So these are smaller groups. There's groups, there's the captain, the volunteer captain, and maybe three or four volunteers who go around the shelter and learn our protocols for socializing with cats or dogs safely and how to walk the dogs. For example, they have to have two leashes on the harness and the collar, redundancy in case one piece of walking equipment fails. Um, and then um, we also want to create opportunities that lets them um, move up in the organization because this will add to the retention if they feel more valued and there's more animals for them to work with, um, if they can get to level two. So we have two levels of cat volunteers and three levels of dog volunteers. So you know the level two cats, maybe they're a little more shy, whatever the situation is, more fearful. Volunteers can really develop their handling skills, how to read the, the, the body language and work with those cats. And those are the cats that really need them. The level, one, the level one cats are the easy cats, the kittens. They fly out the door, right? But these other cats, they need a little bit more help. Um, and then this leads, and we also look to fast track people on one of these walks with a, with a captain. Maybe somebody, they've had cats, you know, really tough cats their whole life. Let's fast track them to level two. Same thing for the dogs. Um, and then uh, as needed, we send them uh, updates on any protocols that have changed. The sign here with all the colors, we haven't released that yet. That's a new, we're changing all the signage for the cat rooms to just codes. So um, a room will have like a green circle on it and posted on the walls nearby will be what is the protocol for volunteers to socialize in that room. They don't know this yet, you're the first to hear about it. Um, <laughs> but um, that's gonna be a really big change. So we have to really communicate that with them. We're gonna do it in several ways. We have alerts through the database, emails, and through constant contact where I can actually see who opened an email. Now opening it doesn't mean they read it, but at least it means that they opened it, right? <laughs> and then communicating with volunteers. What time is it? Communicating with volunteers is really essential. Basically, running a volunteer program is a customer service role. That's really what we're here about. Yes, we want to keep everybody safe, but it's customer service, just like the adoption center is a customer service function. And in fact, I tell volunteers who are interested in being adoption counselors that it's not about socializing. It's about customer service. And they have to be honest with themselves. You have to be a people person to be an adoption counselor. Because not everybody who walks in the door is a people person, right? Um, you may just get like this flat affect from somebody who's coming in, but it doesn't mean they're not gonna be a great adopter, right? All that love and communication that they can't give to people goes right into that animal. They're probably great adopters, but it's hard to sometimes to work with people like that. Um, so when we're communicating with volunteers as a group, again, I come back to context. Always provide context for what you're talking about. Um, and be transparent. We share a lot about what's going on um, through the, around the ASPCA so that they feel that they're part of a program and why sometimes changes are important or like the euthanasia policy, things like that. And listen for feedback. Volunteers have great ideas. Um, and then we have to talk sometimes one-on-one -on -one with volunteers. Now, sometimes it's great and they're just coming to chit-chat or talk about their pets, whatever, and that's a great interaction. But sometimes it's not so great. If Maybe there was an incident that the volunteer really violated a rule or something like that, and you have to talk to them. Well, it's really important when they come, when they come to meet with you that, first of all, that you're respectful and not leap to judgment about what happened. Um, remember that not everybody's a people person, right? They may be shy. They may be shut down. They may not be giving you feedback. But you have to try to coax that out of them so that you know that they're understanding what you're talking about. And ethics. Right? Don't judge. Be respectful. Give them your full attention. Um, listen, you know, listen to their side of the story. Um, uh, maintain their confidentiality about what's going on. Right? You don't want to talk to other volunteers about that kind of thing. Um, when possible, give them feedback, positive feedback. It's really important to speak in person and not do things over email. It's, it's a great 
to, to follow up with an email that's, you know, hi, just want to read, you know, just sort of summarize what we talked about and that you're going to do this and I'm going to do that, whatever, and follow up in an email. But the initial discussion needs to be in person. That's a real respect thing. And it's hard. It'd be easier to do something over an email and just type out an email. But we can't always control how people read, you know, hear that, the tone of the email. So we have to do things in person. Um, and really, I should have put this in red. Address issues in a timely manner. This is really, really important. <coughs> Excuse me. It's really hard to get back to somebody two or three weeks later about an incident that they did. That's not really fair, right? So if you can address it in the day, in the same day, or something just happened and a staff person comes to say, oh, you know, Lisa just did this, you need to talk to her, go find Lisa, bring her in, or take her to a quiet place and talk to her about it. Um, and because it's much less of a mountain of a mole than a molehill. Um, you know what I mean? It's a smaller issue <laughs> if you deal with it that way than letting it brew. And this brings me to non, so this, these were the practices for volunteer program staff. But what about non-volunteer program staff who have to talk to volunteers? Um, one of my pet peeves is um, do as I say, not as I do, which is a not, a, not an effective way of teaching anything. We have to model for volunteers. When we tell them that in the yellow room you have to wear PPE and gloves, and staff just run right in there, but no PPE, and they grab a cat, or they go feed the cat, and then they run. Okay, and then a volunteer gets blamed when they do it. You know, I, that's my pet peeve. We have to model for them all the best behaviors. When we have staff who take a puppy under their arm and not, not even a leash on it, ugh, right? <laughs> so a volunteer would probably be terminated for something like that. So we really have to model for them. That's one of my really big um, best practices. Um, have pos and staff should have positive interactions. What about just saying hi, right? Volunteers aren't invisible. When you're in the elevator with them, say hi, thanks for coming in today. Or God, that was so helpful what you did, thank you so much. You know, mind your manners, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, and then again, for staff, we have to provide them language, and this is something that we're working on right now, to how to address an issue in the moment. I think, you know, there's staff of all different levels. There's a senior vice president in the building, just like there's an animal care technician. And the animal care technician may not feel that he or she has the skills to address issues um, uh, directly with a volunteer. But I always tell them, if you're just polite, it's okay. Because if you see something, say something. Because otherwise, it really becomes um, much bigger than it is because you come and you tattletale to me and then I have to go find the person or I have to call them up and it's a whole big thing and then volunteers get defensive. It's so much easier to say, excuse me, you know, maybe you didn't realize this cat is, you know, can't be socialized, there's a sign on her kennel. End of story. Oh, you know, and then they can come to us and we can, you know, talk to the volunteer and say, you know, do you need a refresher? Is there something you weren't clear about? Was the sign not clear? Things like that. Um, uh, so volunteer um, engagement and recognition. Um, it's more cost effective to retain than to, um, than to retrain, right? So, or to train in general. Um, so one of the things is we always try to acknowledge volunteers. And one of the, really hard for me, maybe easier for some, is getting to know people's names. So we have ID, IDs for them, but sometimes they're turned around. It's really hard. You know, you, you know your core volunteers, the ones who are there every day, but it's hard to get to know people's names. What cracks me up is sometimes when they don't know my name and it's right on my door. That cracks, that cracks me up. Um, but that's fine, you know, I don't take offense at that. Um, personalized follow-up, those emails. If you know volunteers, don't, we have a volunteer right now. Um, she was one of our, really our top volunteers. She's very ill and then her husband died all at the same time. So we're following up with constant phone calls. She misses us, send her, you know, snail mail is great. When was the last time you got a piece of mail that was like handwritten, right? How, when you get a card, how impactful that is. Some, someone took the time to write that. We write thank you notes, we write condolence notes. Um, we send birthday emails, milestone emails. Hi, you've, you've hit 500 hours, you've hit 1,000 hours. Um, we send out notes like that. Those are by email though, I may add. Um, but there's nothing like a personalized note. Um, and then, then celebrations. So in two weeks, we're having our annual ice cream social, and volunteers love that, and it's actually like a little award ceremony. So here on the bottom, you can see we have these certificates, and two volunteers who received them last year, Ginger re re received the Certificate of Appreciation, the Dog's Best Friend Award, and um, Leslie received the Faithful Feline Sidekick Award. 
She's an amazing cat volunteer. She does so much. She syringe feeds and does a thousand things for us. She's amazing volunteers. And it deserves to be recognized. And now we have all the different departments that volunteers work with actually tell us who they're nominating and they present the award themselves. And it's a really fun event, ice cream and root beer floats and things like that. Um, then we have, at the holidays, we have our holiday party. It's a catered event with hot food. It's only vegetarian and vegan, which a lot of people appreciate. And there's no awards at that one. And I really, you know, and it's a great opportunity for staff to mingle with volunteers and get to know them better. Um, and then there's volunteer, uh, National Volunteer Appreciation Week, which is in April. It's a lot. It's a week of events, right? <laughs> How to keep people entertained for a week. So we have like three pizza parties, things like that. We have a daily trivia contest. And Julie is, writes the most fantastic emails. And the winners of the trivia contest get to name a kitten. So this is, a, you know, it's, I, don't, I forget who came up with that idea, but what a great idea, right? Instead of giving them a piece of swag or, you know, an ASPCA, I don't know, a little rubber bracelet or something like that, nobody wants that stuff. To name a kitten that's meaningful for them, awesome, right? Um, so we have like count the candies. One year we had our baby picture, so match the picture with the adult, you know, and they got two of us confused, it was really funny. Um, there's a little fun things to get them engaged and we have a ton of signage. We put posters up with how many years everyone's been there, how many hours they've been there over the lifetime, everything to make them feel a part of the program. And then we offer continuing education classes as well. Um, and that's a way to keep the, um, and learn about things, like about forensics that are going on, um, animal poison control, what they do, all kinds of subjects. And those are all available through the research. So they, if they missed it, they can always uh, read it. So here are some examples. So on the left is our birthday card. We send out an automated um, birthday card every, at the beginning of every month. So I'll be doing that next week. And it's really cute. So we have a, a dog and a cat wearing the same coat. I don't know whose animals these are. It says, happy birthday, Laura. The animals have been gossiping, and they tell us it's your birthday month. On behalf of everyone at the ACE PCA, we wish you a great day and a fantastic year. We thank you for everything you do throughout the year and hope that volunteering with the animals helps keep you young. And they love this. I often get a lot of really great response. And in September, I'll be changing the picture because it will have gone through another year. Um, this is our invitation to our ice cream party coming up. This is like half of our newsletter. Um, so we include a comic. We have the funnies. So I always include, include a cute cartoon and a really fun video. The list of all the animals that were adopted last month, volunteers love that. They can see all the cats, the kittens, the dogs, and the puppies. And sometimes there's a miscellaneous other uh, in there um, uh, who got adopted. And they can look for their favorites. You know, was Fluffy adopted last month? It's great. Um, what's going on? Some of the accomplishments around the ASPCA last, last month. You know, we rescued animals from a dogfighting case or from a natural disaster. Or we won some sort of advocacy. And there's a law that's going to be changed. Really important for them to know um, that we're doing this kind of work. And I have an office foster. I have a cat in my office at all times. I've actually, right now I have Samantha, and she's my 60th an, um, office foster. And she's been with me about a month. Um, she went from not being touchable to being a Klingon, um, <laughs> um, but very conflicted. So she clings to you, and then she swats you. So this is what we're working on, and these are the kinds of things. that That's why they, you know, she hates other cats. So for her to be in a cat room was not the best thing for her. So she made her way to my office. Uh, we love each other, but she's a bit of a challenge. But I always talk about my office foster. So what's the update? Who got, you know, one of them got adopted, now I have a new one, and what's she like? And thank, thanking the volunteers who come to really work with those cats and make a difference and improve their behavior. So there's all kinds of information in the newsletter, including reminders. Don't forget, you need to say this, you, know, you need to say dog when you're walking a dog out of the elevator, things like that. Um, so we do a lot of outreach. And then here at the bottom right, we have a picture from one of our uh, parties. And then this is my crew. Um, on the left, except that Beverly in the middle just recently retired, and now we have a brand new staff person who was a volunteer for 13 years. So volunteer retention. Um, this is one of our most challenging issues, and this is something we're constantly working on, and I would love to hear ideas that you have to help retain volunteers. Um, because like I said, like we're, we're not even quite at the 50% mark. I thought we were, but we're not. So we really want to try to at least get to that level. So create opportunities for our most, for our best and most committed volunteers. Leadership roles for them. Let them work with animals that are behind the scenes that are not available yet for adoption. We have um, ringworm rooms. 
volunteers who are willing to go into ringworm and work with those animals, provide them the socialization that they need. They're in there for a while, like these poor cats, they need help. Or maybe it's even a dog who maybe who has ringworm. Um, uh, right, so this is a picture of Diane. She's one of our mates. She's like such the cat whisperer. She can handle any cat, and she'll work with them for months. A cat that will not come out and will finally eventually come out, and she's adopted some of these hard-to-adopt cats. And here she is. This was a cat that she was actually doing agility with, and the, the, we did a whole story around that um, on our website, Go, jumping through hoops and everything like that. And it's so enriching for some of these cats that just need that extra... Um, enrichment for them, because they're going to go stir-crazy in, in, in a kennel. And some of them participate in media events. Uh, we had an a interview yesterday about foster programs on New York One. One of our dog handlers was on the stage um, and videotaped holding one of our dogs. Um, and they love that. They get invited. But those are the more regular volunteers who really put in the time and that we know, we know what their skills are, that they can handle a situation like that. Because some of the animals can freak out being on a film studio and everything. Um, and then, of course, unfortunately, sometimes we need to terminate volunteers. So really important to get the whole story. We had a, a this was a few years ago, a staff person who came, this person just did this and then you need to talk to her. And we got so riled up by her that we went and immediately went and talked to the volunteer who said, Wait, whoa, 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 that's not what happened. And, she, and this was like a long-term volunteer. And we were very lucky that she was under, and we're like, oh, sorry. You know, when we really learned from that, you can't just, jump the gun. You need to get the, get the facts, take a deep breath, and then go talk to them. And talk to them courteously. Bring them to your office and have a discussion. What happened? You know, there's more than one side to every story. Um, in fact, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote, there are always four sides to a story. Your side, their side, the truth, and what really happened, right? <laughs> so there's not, there's always different perspectives on what happened. Um, and remember, sometimes people just make an honest mistake. They haven't been to the shelter for two months. They forgot. Uh, yesterday, a, there was a harness that was broken in two, and the volunteer tried to put it on a dog. So needless to say, she couldn't quite figure out how to put it on because it didn't make any sense. OK. So you know, funny things happen. Um, but we corrected it. We're not going to ban her from the program. It was an honest mistake. You know, we were lucky that a behavior person saw her. And then, but she came to me. She goes, you know, this weird thing happened. I didn't know what to do. But somebody left it on the door broken. That, that was mistake number one. She shouldn't even been able to see the, the, find the harness. So people make honest mistakes, and you have to just say, you know, do you need retraining, whatever, address it. Um, who's the volunteer? Is it a VIP? We have certain VIP volunteers. You know, they're not always the best volunteers, but you know what? You grin and bear it, right? <laughs> so nothing you can do. You know, you try to talk to them. You know, please remember to do this or that. That's about as far as you can go. Um, what's not an acceptable mistake? Um, <clears throat> We had a volunteer, she was, this was during you know, the Cat Friday event, right? The Black Friday, yeah, Cat Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, huge adoption events. Um, she was fine. The next day she comes in on Saturday, she was drunk. And she manhandled some, uh, an adopter, insisting that the woman, she grabbed her by the arm, you're not good enough to adopt that cat. I mean, twice, in two different rooms she did that. We terminated her on the spot. Um, we also had three young girls, 16 years old, who are not allowed to socialize with dogs, they're not trained. We had this little dog named Trusty, blind dog. They felt so sorry for this little dog who was a level three, volunteer, level three dog, so required only very few volunteers could handle because he was blind, a lot of issues. They went in and got the dog out without any walking equipment. It was just a really bad scene. And fortunately, one of our volunteer dog mentors um, saw this corrected it and knew these kids were really young. She's, got a, she's a mother of a 16-year-old herself. And they got all messed up. Well, what level are you? Um, 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 they couldn't answer the questions. Um, and I mean, they violated so many rules, I terminated all three of them. Um, you know, and we sent notes to their, mother, to their parents as well. So they, and one of the girls needed 300 hours of community service to graduate and had just started. So I don't know what happened, but they really, it was really bad. I mean, they lied. It was like 15 things were wrong with the story. Um, consider alternatives to termination. Maybe a program is just not right for them. Maybe adoptions, they just can't remember all the rules and everything for that. So you know what? They can go socialize with cats and dogs. They can still remain in the program, but partake in other, uh, other activities. But it's really important, just like you would for staff. You have to document. You've got to keep a record of what's going on. Because if they're repeat offenders, at some point you're going to terminate them from the program. 
um, uh, and be specific and document it in your database or somewhere so that if you're not here one day, you know, you're on vacation and there's another incident, your staff or somebody else can see the record. You can't, if you just keep it up here, it doesn't do anybody any good but you. Um, and if you're like me, after like two weeks, you're not going to remember it anyway. Um, and also, run it by management. Make sure that they understand um, that you're going to terminate somebody because somebody could take this to Facebook, right? You don't know, and you've got to be ready to see this stuff in print, um, so, which is why best practice, do it in person, right? It's hard. It's really, fortunately, it's very few, and few, this doesn't happen very often, but it's really hard. It's unpleasant. I always have someone with me. If we can't do it by phone, because sometimes I've emailed people, say, hi, I need to see you. Please come to my office. Between, you know, I can see you Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday at these times, and they know what's coming. So they'll usually say, well, if you're going to fire me, just do it, you know, just email me, and I will not do that. So I will at least call somebody if they don't want to come in. Because I was like, well, they should come in. And one of my colleagues said, well, if that were me, I wouldn't want to come in and have other volunteers see me and staff see me and they know what's going on. I don't think that's respectful. I'm like, you know what, that's a really interesting perspective. So we'll do it by phone, but I will not do it by email. That's one thing I will not do, because once it's in writing, right, it's out there forever. And then finally, oh, right on time, um, there's always room for improvement in, a, in, a, a, in any kind of program, volunteer program, any kind of program. So um, how can we evaluate what's going on? So first of all, have an open door policy. I mean, our volunteers come and talk to us all the time. It's really hard. Sometimes you just want to close your door and get some work done, right? But that's part of the socialization. You know, I mean, the, the ones who aren't people people, they're happy to go play with the animals all day. But some people are there for social interaction, right? Some people are really lonely, and this is how they're getting their social interaction. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, so be available to your volunteers. Um, and get, get feedback. You know, people come to me, especially the ones who are like the real regulars, they don't hesitate. So they come to my office, they say, we could be doing this better. You know what? The, those socialization clips to know which cats have been socialized with, that was a volunteer idea. And now we actually did a story on our website or on ASPCA Pro, and other shelters, I think, are now adopting that practice. It's a little thing. And the plastic, first of all, they're really cheap, because we had all these fancy paper clips and everything like that, and they were disappearing. The, these plastic ones, they can go into a bucket of Excel and get reused, right? They can be decontaminated. Um, so, the, so volunteers have great ideas. Have a suggestion box. We have one in the volunteer locker room, they can, and the name is optional. The one problem with that is without a name, we can't reply, we can't address the issue. Now, it's, if it's a gen general kind of thing, but a volunteer recently left an, a suggestion, it wasn't a suggestion, it was more of an observation, about she didn't like one of the names the cat had. Okay, now, and it was totally understandable because the cat um, had a neurological problem and the name was given was Big Head. Okay, and I totally, agree. now apparently that's a character from some show. Now, I wasn't familiar with it. I don't know what show or movie or something this is from. It's, I don't know if it's like a, um, a cartoon thing, like from a superhero, I don't know what it's from, but apparently it's some reference like that. Okay, well, I didn't know that. So I'm like, she's absolutely right, that's offensive. So we changed the, now it was a kitten. So um, by the time, he was being spayed and neutered, so we changed the name. He was probably adopted within two days, but we were never, never able to reply to that volunteer that we agreed with her and changed the name. <laughs> so it was too bad, because we couldn't address and say, you know what, we hear you. So, that, you know, so as much as possible, we encourage them to put their name, so at least we can address it. And then from a bigger perspective, we can always do a survey. What's, your satis what's the satisfaction level of your program? We did one about two years ago. Fortunately, we had a really good response. Uh, favorable, uh, people are very satisfied. I was a little afraid, I didn't know what to expect. But you can't be afraid of the feedback, right? Because all that, even if it's negative feedback, it means there's room for improvement, and there's always room for improvement. Um, something that I'm considering doing is a survey about inactive volunteers. Coming back to that retraining and retaining. Why did they leave? They came to orientation, they paid a fee, they signed their waivers, why did they never come back? Now, maybe it's location. We're in a, it takes, 10 to 15, you know, we're 10 to 15 minutes from the nearest subway stop. Although two, stop, uh, two stops that are a little bit closer just recently opened with a new subway line. So that's gonna help a little bit. Um, is it the hours? Is it they don't feel a part of the pro What's the problem? Um, and then an idea that um, Abby, who's our manager of volunteer um, uh, engagement, had the idea about doing survey, very short, easy surveys 
after trainings and events, right? Was the training effective? We don't know, right? We think it is, we've developed it, but maybe it's not effective. Maybe it could be half as long, right? Or maybe it needs to be longer, maybe it's whatever, maybe it's too much material, whatever. Um, so these are things that surveys can help you with. Um, this little cartoon is really cute. It says, our study concludes that this is the percentage of customers who will buy from us without any effort whatsoever on our part. It's a big fat zero, right? <laughs> so you really have to do surveys and get feedback from volunteers as to whether the, the program is fulfilling to them. But of course, it also has to meet your needs. It's really, it's, a, it, it's not just all about them. It's about the program itself too and meeting the needs of the organization and the animals. So <clears throat> finally, so just to come full circle, there's a lot of resources out there to help you. These were some of our best practices that I shared today. Um, but some resources out there that are really impactful is ASPCA Pro. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a resource for animal welfare professionals as well as um, um, veterinary um, personnel and volunteers. There's a ton of information in there on volunteer management, including webinars, old webinars that you can just click on and watch. Um, and they always tell you about upcoming webinars, things like that. It's really a fantastic resource. And not just for volunteer management, for all kinds of things, shelter management. Points of Life help, help, <coughs> excuse me, helps your nonprofit find volunteers and equips you with the skills and resources that you need to, to manage volunteers more effectively. Um, that was the program developed by uh, President Bush in 1989. Really great. And they have a fantastic annual conference. If you can go, I, I highly recommend it. And then there's the CCVA, um, the C Council for Certification in Volunteer Administration. Um, it advances excellence in volunteer administration by delivering professional certification and advancing ethical practice. Um, you can actually become certified in volunteer management. I did that last year, and I did find it impactful. Um, so these are other resources for you. Um, perfect. So um, this, uh, these are our best practices. I don't know if you have any questions. Th yes. The question was, what database do we use to keep um, to track volunteers and their hours? We use a program called Civicor. It's actually a uh, proprietary database, um, but I'd be happy to share that information and give you contact information. It's a very robust database. We can give alerts. We can track their time down to a specific activity. Um, we know what their start date is. Um, we can email them through it, although we don't really use that function. We can run the, it's a fairly intuitive program. Um, we can run reports for statistical purposes, which is really important for fundraising and everything. And you want your manager to know what you're doing all year, right? It's a really great program. I can give you information on that. Yes, somebody else had a question? Yes. Um, do you also, I, did, I, I understand the volunteers, but do you also accept um, like community service through probation or anything like that? And is that, do you give it Great question. The question was, um, do we accept commu community court mandated community service? We do not. That is something we do not do. Yes. Okay, so the question was um, about describing our dog reading program. The dog reading program is a not physically interactive program. They read outside the kennel. Right now, it's in, a sort, it's in our um, animal recovery center, which is where the NYPD rescue dogs are. We want to bring it to the adoption center, but they will also be reading outside the kennel. So typically, you're in a vestibule. There'll be different you know, numbers of kennels there, um, and they can read to all of them. And we identify which dogs can be read to and which ones can't. And it's important for volunteers, first of all, it's a, it's a program that they can start almost immediately. So that addresses the waiting period while they're being trained. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they have to sort of be able to read the body language. If a dog is barking, it's supposed to be impactful for the animal in a positive way. It's supposed to be enriching for them. If they're getting really stressed out, we tell the volunteers, give it a minute, see if the animal calms down, and then walk away. And we provide stools for them, and they can read. And Volunteers find that 20 minutes per vestibule is like really good. Now, it's hard to read out loud for 20 minutes and then go to another one and read another 20 minutes out loud. Um, but it's all not physically interactive. They don't, do not enter, they are, absolutely cannot go into the kennels. Right. Great question. Um, the question is, have we, given that some people like more structure, have we considered creating shifts for social animal socialization? Um, no, we haven't done that. It would be an interesting study to do. Right now for walking the puppies, we do have, we have schedules from 9 to 11 and I forget what the afternoon hours are. Doesn't seem to be, it's, just, it's really more so that we know if volunteers are actually going to come and do it. 
um, more than that's because they can come at 10. They don't have to come necessarily at 9. They can come at 10. We just want to know that somebody is actually coming to do it. Um, but that's an interesting proposition. I'll take that back to my, my, my team. Yeah. We require, for our adoption counselors, we require that they, that they fulfill two shifts a month. Um, but even that, we don't always succeed in that. You know, we have a lot of volunteers doing a lot more than that, so we're just able to fill our shifts. Because, like, for example, on a Saturday morning, we need eight adoption counselors um, to manage the, the crowds that are coming to adopt. Um, did I tell you that we did 4,290 adoptions last year? Yeah, so, and we gave 20, 21,000 visitors to the adoption center, and we gave almost 7,000 tours. So we need a lot of adoption counselors to take part in that. Um, and, uh, and sometimes people don't fulfill their, their requirements. Yes? Last year, I think we took in about 5,000 animals, right? And we also have animals in foster care and the hospital, I mean, there's animals. We took in 1,736 kittens last year, from neonates to whatever, um, you know, to six weeks old, whatever, to get them ready to, to eight weeks and ready for spay and neuter and then adoption. Uh, yes? So we, we, the question was about our $25 orientation fee. Um, we ask for $25, it covers all their training, their first t-shirt, um, their ID, all that kind of stuff. And then kind of a, fulfill, uh, a commitment on their part. If we waive it for anybody who is a full, who's a student, who can produce a student ID, whether it's even a part-time college student, that's fine. Um, if people say, you know, I'm on you know, very limited income, we'll waive it. You know, we want to make it accessible to people. We don't want to be a, ba a barrier to adoption. Um, but we do, it does help us cover some of our costs. Um, okay, oh, sorry, I'm getting uh, signals that we're, that we're done. I'm, sorry. I'm happy to stay outside and answer all of your questions. Uh, my email address is laura.frank at aspca.org if you'd like to email me. And again, I'll be outside if you want to um, ask any questions and share your practices. Thank you so much.